Thank you for watching, liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing right now. Can you hear me? Is it on? Great, great. Um, I just want to introduce myself and let you know um, where I'm coming from. So if I start to explain what RSS is and blogs are, you won't be offended. Um, <laughs> I have two lives. I have my offline life, and I'm a technology trainer for nonprofits. And I've been doing this um, for 30 years. And, um, and that's a photo of me in Cambodia. I was invited to come and do Web 2.0 workshops at a Cambodian blogger summit. I've been following the Cambodian blogosphere for a couple of years, and they invited me over, but there was no money in the budget. So I took to my blog, and I raised enough money to help sponsor the conference. And not only that, I was able to get 300 technology t-shirts donated as prizes and swag. Awesome. And then I have my life online. I write a blog called Beth's Blog. All you need to do is Google Beth. I usually come up in the top results. I don't know where I am today. And it's all about how nonprofits can use social media for good, for their missions. And the way I go about doing that is I launch experiments with all different kinds of tools. I like to play with the tools, and I externalize and share what I've learned. And I involve people who work in nonprofits in the conversation about uh, lessons learned. Sometimes my online and my offline lives are collide. I usually have one foot in the early adopter camp and the rest um, with the laggards. So you've all seen Jeffrey Moore's uh, uh, technology adoption curve. Do I need to explain this? Okay, how many of you were early adopters? Okay, <laughs> all right, <laughs> great. Okay, usually when I talk to nonprofits and work with nonprofits, most of them are like here, okay? Is a blog the same thing as RSS? Like, whoa, what's RSS again? Huh? Um, so I was, at, um, I was called in by this um, very prestigious girls boarding school to come do a board retreat with their board and um, help, uh, teach them about social media. So it was sort of social media preschool, very simple. So um, this is what it looked like. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Okay, and I, like, I, I show them examples, I explain it, I think, very clearly, and then I actually demonstrate the tools. So I had taken this photo with my cell phone and I emailed it up to Flickr. And they were like, wow. <laughs> okay, and then, and this is back in February, so Twitter, was still not, you know, the, laggard, the laggards and the still hadn't quite, what's Twitter? Oh, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. So I wanted to kind of demonstrate um, the power of Twitter. So I had um, a browser open and I put out a tweet that, to my network that said, tell me the value of Twitter. And I had a tab open and I kept on refreshing and I got, you know, half decent responses, I'd say 10, 15 responses, and they were okay. And then I got this idea because I saw, the, I saw this. And, and all kinds of frowns. So I got the idea, why don't, I'm gonna put this out on Twitter and ask people to do comments back on the, the Flickr page. I didn't know what was gonna happen. So I, I did that and I started refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> right in front of their eyes. And look, you all know what this is, I don't need to explain that. But I, um, I didn't run my mouse over the comments because they were kind of um, not so nice. Like this one was like, why is his hand in his pocket? <laughs> uh, <laughs> There was one back there saying, I'm so bored at this meeting. There was one here, a, a thought bubble. If I was at this meeting, I'd be Twittering all the time, so on and so <laughs> forth. <laughs> okay, so, and literally I was refreshing and I got 122 comments in like three or four or five minutes. I said, wow. So, what the, just happened? Like, so I, I was just thinking on my feet and I went back and I to analyze it. So this is what happened. Um, Ponzi, who, re who follows my tweet, you know, told them all to listen to me. <laughs> um, and then she forwarded it over to Chris. Chris came and said, what, you haven't heard about Twitter? <laughs> were you born in the 19th century or something? And I think they were. Um, <laughs> and then Chris Brogan came because uh, Prillo told him to come to Twitter. And so what happened here was, when Prillo calls via Chris Brogan, the world shows up. So what, it, what I was able to do was to show them what is a network effect you know, rapid word of mouth, and they were like amazed and all ready to start their social media um, strategy. What I'm going to talk, um, what I'm going to talk about today, I'm actually going to just tell you a story about how I've raised money um, 
through social media tools to support disadvantaged children in Cambodia. I've run five different campaigns over the last two years, experimenting with a variety of tools, very publicly, ex uh, writing case studies about what I learned. And so I've learned what works and what doesn't work. And I've also kind of created a, a community of people who really care about kids in Cambodia. And I'm going to talk about my most recent campaign, the America's Giving Challenge. I came in first place for global causes, raising almost $100,000, OK? So I'm going to share with you how, how, how I did that. Um, I raised $43,000 from people who donated, and then I won a $50,000 uh, prize. And total over all my campaigns, I've raised over $200,000. So five campaigns. OK, so all of this money is going to benefit this nonprofit organization, the Sharing Foundation. I sit on the board. I'm a volunteer. So, that, so the money was not going into my pocket. It was going straight to the organization. And um, so the contest, this was an initiative by the Case Foundation. Stephen Case, that sounds familiar. And Parade Magazine. And what they wanted to do was to test a couple of ideas here. That anybody could go out and use these new tools and raise money for a cause. And use these new tools, you know, Facebook, widgets, charity badges and raise money. So the contest um, opened on December 13th, 2007 at 3 p.m. So what happens at 3.01 p.m.? I open my kimono. In other words, I took my blog and I had an initial strategy and I shared with my readers um, what I was thinking about doing. Now, you might say that might be pretty dumb because all your readers are nonprofit organizations and they could have entered the contest you know, and beat you. But it was actually the smartest thing I've done because my readers are really smart and they gave me lots of really good tips and it helped me generate um, a team of volunteers who helped me. And I've done that with every single campaign, sort of being open at the beginning um, to generate interest, get advice, and listen. So my first strategy and what works here is to make it personal. You know, I can go and ask Jay, <laughs> Jay Cross, you know, will you give me 10 bucks for Cambodia? And he, he I know him, he, he might like me, and he'd say, yeah, 10 bucks, sure. It's likability, social likability. There's a whole theory about it called the uh, psychology of influence. If you want to go deep, there's a whole book there. So when I talk about my cause, I make it very personal. And let me give you an example. That's my family and my two kids. And as you can see, they were adopted from Cambodia. That's what they look like in the orphanage. That's Harry, and that's Sarah. That's what they look like now, OK? <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're happy. They have food. They have medical care. And as my son likes to point out, his own Creative Commons t-shirt, and laptop and Wi-Fi. But there were other kids who don't have these benefits who are in Cambodia. Like Savon. She's the head of her household. She doesn't have parents. She takes care of her two sisters. And she's able to do this because she has a job through a program by the Sharing Foundation. And her sisters are going to school. And because of the Sharing Foundation's programs, they have an opportunity for a better life. And that's very important to me and my family. And that's why I raise money for Cambodia. So does personality scale? Let's take a look at that. In nonprofit world, we have this thing called the ladder of engagement. Are you familiar with it? Well, it's, it's, I'm not going to explain the whole thing, but it's very simple that people who give to fundraising campaigns or become active go through different stages from passive bystander on on up to being able to pass giving money to actually soliciting their friends. And so the idea is that a personal fundraiser uses different strategies to bring people through the ladder of engagement. Not everybody goes to the top. It doesn't go in a kind of linear order. But, um, but there's a couple of things that you need to use. And those are stories. So in my campaign, I had a three-point story strategy. First thing I wanted to do was to tell stories about the kids. 
and the impact that the Sharon Foundation has had on the lives of these kids in Cambodia. The second thing I wanted to do was tell stories about the people who were supporting this campaign, the sense of momentum, what people celebrate and reward people's creativity in the ways that they were helping to raise money and helping this contest. And the third thing, because my blog is about how nonprofits use social media, if I just blogged uh, for 50 days uh, asking people for money, my, it would piss off my readers. So I shared a story about what I learned about doing this work as it was unfolding. So there's also an, another important concept, and that's called network weaving. And let me show you the three R's of network weaving very quickly. There's relationship building. It's all about the relationship, one-on-one, -on -one, knowing, knowing your donors and, and knowing the, the people in your community. There's rewards, writing a post about someone, saying thank you, giving them a little present. And then there's this idea of reciprocity. Because, you know, people treat you like they've been, they've been treated by you. Oh, I just messed that up. But, but you understand. Um, so I'm like banking social capital. I, I do a lot of random acts of kindness and without any expect for return. And, and sometimes I get returns and sometimes I don't. So it's about the reciprocity. Okay, so let me show you this in action. Um, one of my campaigns where I told you the t-shirts that I got donated for the bloggers conference, I had so many t-shirts that I had extras for kids in the orphanage and the Sharing Foundation program. So I told stories about the t-shirts. Um, so as you know, I am a, a Creative Commons advocate. Uh, we won first prize in the re remix contest two years ago. I uh, fundraised on their behalf uh, the month of November. Um, when the campaign for the America's Giving Challenge was going on, they went out to their supporters in their Facebook cause and asked them to support my cause. But it didn't just stop, about, or it wasn't around asking for money. The relationships continued. For example, Montafia Soka. Her father's a human rights leader in Cambodia. He was thrown in jail. Um, and the mainstream press wasn't covering it. So I blogged about it. I helped her out. She wanted to come to law school in the US. I connected her with people I knew here. She's back in Cambodia now, and she's helping to start the Cambodian Creative Commons licensing process. So it's all about this kind of interweaving of relationships. OK, strategies. Fun, humor, make it easy. Urgency is really important. And there's this competitive spirit of competitions. And of course, most importantly, passion. You have to really believe in your cause. So what's more fun than a birthday party? So I, uh, luckily, my birthday was happening during the um, competition. So I ran a birthday party asking people to donate 10 bucks in my honor. And I uh, threw out my status line on uh, Facebook. And the gifts started coming in even from a lot of the Cambodians that I've been hanging out with on Facebook. Yes, in Cambodia, they like Facebook, and high five, too. Even the guy that I just knocked out of first place, my competition wished me happy birthday. Um, I made a series of videos with my kids, and we tested both kids together, uh, funny, sad, humorous. And what wor seemed to work was my son saying, it's up to you, because we don't have any credit cards to donate money for mommy's <laughs> birthday. And, and what happened here is this guy, Ken Ring, he has a really large uh, network of people who are really interested in Cambodia, 2,600 subscribers, and then he went out and solicited his network on my behalf. So I went on Twitter, hitching around that it was my birthday. Um, I blogged a story about my birthday and how the kids in the orphanage celebrate their birthdays. I tagged my evangelists on Facebook. These are people that I, hadn't, that I didn't know face to face, they, that we shared some common connection. Adoptive parents, Cambodian Americans, uh, people who are just really interested in seeing and learning about um, uh, socially networked personal fundraising. And I even got a Bethcast. I'm, I'm active in the screencasting community, and Christine Martell made a screencast analyzing all of my snapshots and photos that were in, um, that I used in the campaign as to their aesthetics and whether they were, how engaging they were, and came up with a list of tips in terms of how to create engaging visuals. And she even pointed out that this picture, one of my absolute favorites, you know how long it took me to get those kids to look me in the eye and smile? <laughs> that I'd also captured uh, somebody's butt. <laughs> 
and, I, and it, I've had that picture for a couple years and I never noticed that. <laughs> so in the blog posts, um, my, my friends, my supporters leveraged their networks. This is um, NetSquared, um, also le um, supporting the Frozen P Fund, which was also going on at the same time. And well, are you wondering where these like, embarrassing pictures are coming from? You see, that's me. Well, for my 50th birthday, I held a, uh, a Flickr 50th birthday photo remix contest where I put 50 of the most ridiculous pictures of me up on Flickr and invited people to remix them. And I would donate 50 bucks to the winner's charity of choice. Well, I was like really relieved that they didn't find all of those pictures that were up there. And this came in this kind of idea about what will get people to click to the fundraising pitch. So would you click on this? <laughs> Don't answer that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so what happened? I had 142 people wish me happy birthday, 125 people donated, and 180 views on a see me naked photo. <laughs> okay. It tells you something. Okay, so, you know, my birthday was on the beginning of the month, and there were 20 more days to this contest, and I really couldn't keep up the intensity. I kind of felt I might annoy people, and I, you know, I just, I couldn't do it. So what I started to do in the middle part of the campaign was just, it looked like this. <laughs> Not intensely, you know, I kept on blogging stories, and actually that is uh, Tara's food camp t-shirt that she took off her bathroom wall and sent to me that I gave to Farof, who is an orphan, who's in the orphanage. Her parents died. She showed up at the gate with her um, infant brother who was starving, and the Sharing Foundation took her in, and now she's going to college. And she picked out the food camp t-shirt. So, you know, I told stories about the kids, the t-shirts. I had given away a lot of t-shirts, so I had a lot, of, a lot of material. And uh, blo other bloggers started to sign up on a wiki, and they wanted to, you know, get involved. So I would pick, uh, I would find stories that matched their interests um, with bloggers who had big networks. So this is a, Cool Cat Teacher Blog, uh, educational technology blogger, and she blogged a story about our Sharing Foundation Computer School. And I must tell you, uh, Mom Saray, he's the Phnom Penh geek who's out in this village. It doesn't have electricity. The computers are run by a uh, generator. Uh, we, there's no satellite or internet access, except for we've just gotten internet access on cell phone. So this is what happens. When he teaches an internet lesson, he has 15 kids crowded around the computer, and he says, first you'll type you type in your search word into Google, you hit search, and then you wait. Like, it was the most normal thing in the world. And here I was like, it was driving me crazy because it wasn't fast enough. And then proceeded to teach the content of the lesson while he was waiting for the search engine results to appear 10 minutes later. So we had a whole really great discussion about how can we, you know, what can we do with cell phones and social media so he can start to integrate that into his classroom. Um, at one point, I f you, ha I, you had to stay in the top four to win the $50,000, and at one point, I kept on dropping out of first place into fifth place. So I did um, a Twitter rally where I just got people to retweet my message, and out of that, I got 57 donors, and I popped back into first place. So it was like a little bit of an infuser. But what happened is I started to get complaints. Like people said, you're sounding like a PBS fundraiser. Stop it. Will you promise that you won't talk about Cambodia for six months after you, if you win the contest? And I said, sure. And so, of course, the bloggers picked up, and we talked about when does donor fatigue happen? You know, what's that line? So then I learned the art of one-on-one -on -one solicitation on Twitter. So... Um, this is a, someone who didn't give because there wasn't PayPal available. So I, I said, you know, well, do you have your wallet now? <laughs> he said, no, it's many feet away, but I will make an extraordinary effort <laughs> to find it. <laughs> okay, done. That was so painful. I had to get up out of my chair. Well, lesson learned, you know, conversational technique on Twitter really works. And if you're doing a campaign and you have geeks, you've got to have PayPal. There was an offline effort happening as well. Uh, one of my colleagues, I didn't know about this, but was doing a presentation on social media fundraising, and he talked about our campaign. And I had no idea that this was happening until somebody on Twitter <laughs> added me and said, you know, how do I give? There was also um, a significant offline campaign happening with the people who were 
closely involved with the Sharing Foundation. This is Dr. Nancy Henry. She's the founder. She's in her 70s, close to 80. And so she, she couldn't do, I don't, she couldn't de deal with a blog or Facebook. She said, ah, cognitive overload. So we had them, they were going to all their offline networks. They were using email. Um, and my son, Harry, was helping with the tech support effort. <laughs> And of course, I was also writing about what was happening offline. Okay, so here we are. It's 24 hours, okay, before the contest ends, okay? And I had to stay on the leaderboard. Now, there was a leaderboard, and you could actually sit on the leaderboard and hit refresh, and you could see what position you were on the leaderboard. And I would be in first, and then I would be in second, then fourth, then, you know, third. And it was like nerve-wracking, and there was 24 hours to go. And then what happened? <laughs> I had to go offline. I had to get in an airplane and go down and deliver a keynote at a poverty lawyers conference, and they went and they said I couldn't solicit from the stage. And so, like, I'm offline, and I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, what's happening? I can't, you know, I can't be IMing people. I, you know, it was driving me crazy. I can't be at the leaderboard. It was when I really, really wanted to have internet and airplanes. Um, so I get off the plane in Austin, Texas. And I whip out my laptop, and oh crap, we're in fifth place, which means I would have been out. I would have lost the $50,000. I'd worked too hard for this. No, the gloves came off. I was not going to lose. No way. So I uh, tanked up on some lattes, and um, I, put I, I put that message out to all, across all the networks, I, and we said, we're not going to lose. We have 24 hours. We're in fifth place. But, you know, save us. So, okay, Dr. Mani, he's a passionate guy in India. He's a doctor. He raises money for children's heart surgery. He messaged out to 6,000 doctors in India while I was sleeping, and I woke up in the morning. We're back in first place, and I had to learn how to say thank you in different Indian dialects. <laughs> um, they set up a fan page for me on, on, um, uh, on Facebook. People were sending me um, Twitter messages, we're not going to let you lose, Beth. And all those kids that I gave t-shirts to in Cambodia, they took off to a high five network on my behalf. So the money, and the bloggers were writing posts. Some were saying, we desperately need your help. Others were nice about it, like Chris Brogan, who I was texting while I was changing airplanes in Atlanta, help me, help me. And, um, my colleague at Social Actions <laughs> uh, announced that he was going to create a, a really cool widget. It just actually launched where you could actually aggregate all different causes and find people who were interested in your particular cause. And he said, you're the inspiration. That's what you're doing manually. Let's create a tool for this. So, um, so he sent out to his network. I had people who, who um, had smaller networks but said, let's surprise Beth. Let's drop a little love. And what was amazing about this post is it, it confirmed to me that the storytelling strategy really engaged people because people were looking at the leaderboard. They, they wanted us to win. And then I saw this. <laughs> okay. All right. And I said, oh, God, this guy's calling me a bitch. <laughs> you know, I have my Google alerts on. So I was getting it instantly. And I said, oh, my God, he's calling me a bitch. That was the first thought. The second thought was, did he mention the organization's name? Will anyone see this? Okay. I don't care if my name's, you know. You know, um, so what happened here is, um, uh, is give it up now, bitches. God damn it. You know, click on the fucking link. <laughs> God damn it, do it now. Stop reading, do it now. And anybody who does it now, who gets 10 other people to donate, I'll have a third quarter lunch with them. So the idea is, can you swear like a pirate? <laughs> Win $50,000 for a Cambodian kid? Fuck yeah. <laughs> so on Facebook, I got poked. <laughs> And all the kids in Cambodia um, clasped their hands together in a symbol of saying, thank you. I'm waiting for the video to load. <laughs> Play. Sanju. Sanju. American. Challenge. need to go up on the internet and see it, but it's all the kids in the orphanage saying thank you. So the idea here is, oh, now this is happening. <sighs> oh, 
Okay. All right. Lessons learned. You know, uh, be open. Make it personal. Use the ladder of engagements. Stories. Remember the three R's of network weaving. Fun, humor, easy, urgency, competitive spirit, and say thank you in creative ways. So what's next? Okay, you ready? All right. My first campaign, I raised $800 to send Lang Sopharoff to college. It took me three weeks. She grew up in the same orphanage as my daughter, and uh, if she wasn't going to college, she'd be selling vegetables by the side of the road and living a life of being a subsistence farmer. But the opportunity to um, $800 to send her to college would literally change her life. She's a business and a technology major, by the way. So it took me a couple of weeks. I used email, I used my blog, and I raised 800 bucks to send her to her freshman year of college. The next year, I was able to, uh, with Chris Brogan's help, I don't know if Chris is in the room, and Twitter, we were able to, in less than 24 hours, raise $1,000 to send Lang Sopharoff to her sophomore year. Plus, we went over and we sent another kid to college. Chomp a room. So, I am now raising money for Lang Sopharoff's junior year. And I'm wondering whether or not, do you think that the collective geek power in this room can get 250 people to donate $10 to send a young Cambodian woman to college before this conference ends? So, yeah. fuck yes, yeah, okay. So here's what you do, woo! Okay, this is what you need to do. You need to, what are, oh, no, no. No, but no, well, I'll, I'll jump no, started. Started. here's 100. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Go find me on Twitter, retweet the thing, ask two or three of your friends, go over to my blog, you know, it's PayPal, um, and make a donation. Hmm? Huh? At Cantor, Cantor, on Twitter. Everyone's on Twitter? Okay, or, or Google Beth, find my blog, it's the top post. Okay, so while this experiment is taking place, questions? No questions? I'm gonna actually refresh the, uh, the thermometer, because I always find Just that remember, to, please remember to stand up and oh, wait 12 for the mic. donations, okay. Hello. So uh, first question, did you take a look to see what other charities didn't get money because you won? <laughs> Just as a question. I mean, Are you I hate, it's Cambodian orphans. I can't say a bad okay. thing, but they're all good, right? Right, okay, I won the prize. Everybody who okay. entered raised some additional money they didn't have, right? And I also, on my blog, I don't just promote my own cause. I do a lot with other charities. And I, you know, for nothing. <laughs> you know, I, just, I give back to the field. So I, I know it's gonna bring it on, but I, you know, people are, I just posted somebody else is raising money for breast cancer. She's doing a run. You know, I, I write about that. I help people. I connect people in my network. So, um, yeah, I wish, they had, I wish they had endless pits of money to give everybody who participated some cash. So somebody, people talk about information overload, which for the most part is bullshit, but you, how do you not burn out? How do you, I mean, how do you keep going? How do you how keep, do I keep doing going? all of this? I, um, I spin five days a week when I'm being good and I eat healthy foods, I try to get enough sleep and I go offline, I have my kids, I have that other life. You know, I was just recently presented in Australia and I got the same question. They, they asked me about if I'd ever heard of the slow food movement and, 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 um, and did I ever spend any time offline? And I do, I do. I, you know, I try to take some weekends off <laughs> and, and not be blogging all night. So it's, it's, important, it's a really important thing how to keep balance. It's a different kind of action, different thing. It's not just the knowledge, it's all the Yeah, it is. And you know what's really hard is when you go to Cambodia and you actually see and you meet the people and you see the poverty and you see, you see what's happening in the villages, it like, it just, it refreshes you keeps you going. A great campaign that you put together. I had a quick question. Um, back here. The, the question was, you also mentioned that, there, that you learned some things or mistakes that you made along the way. Can you talk about um, one of those and how you overcome those issues? Because there's a lot of trial and error in this process. Um, well, one of them I showed, which was I, 
overdid it with Twitter and asking for money and using it more like a broadcast tool or pledge drive tool versus conversational. And I was listening very closely. You know, I had Google alerts. I, I listen intensely to what people are saying. And if there's some negative feedback, I, we, we adjust. Activists, I'm a, you know, I'm a longtime act, community activist offline. And the model for activism is you do, you monitor, reflect, and do. So it's a reflecting in action. So it was constant cycle of that. Um, do you want specific mistakes? Uh, you know, I actually have, um, if you go up to um, personalfundraising.wikispaces.com or go to the link to my bio here, I have everything documented. And I, you know, I, sh I, I share my mistakes because mistakes are your best teachers. That's almost in line with the question I was going to ask is that the, uh, the other thing that you're giving that, you're, that you didn't exactly highlight is you're, giving, you're, you're, you're blazing a trail and then you're leaving the path so that other people can do the same thing. So thank you for all the teaching. But how much, how much of an effort is, you to, is it for you to always put that education up there as, along with the work that you do to do the raising? Uh, well, you know what? Those two things have collided. That, that's my work. That's, I, I, you know, I have some paid work where I am teaching and I'm teaching nonprofits. Um, so um, it, it, the thing is the balance between the stuff that I don't charge for. That's, you know, the, the balance. I don't know if that answered your question, Chris. Hi. I was wondering if uh, the charity that you're working with, the, specifically the Cambodia group, do they have their own 51C3 equivalent? Do you get asked that a lot? Does it become a barrier, the whole issue? Where does my tax break going to come from? Um, yeah, uh, the Sharing Foundation is ten, um, entering its 10th year. It is a 501c3. Um, you can actually go up to a place called GuideStar, and you can look at the, all the tax forms from the IRS. I, I'm actually a member of the board. So, um, and a lot of these fundraising tools um, go directly to the organization's checking account or banking account, and it generates a, a, a receipt from the organization. Well, yeah, yeah, there's that, and um, there's also um, a lot, there's like the trust factor, and a lot of that comes from uh, other people who are also involved with the organization then talking to their friends and asking them to donate. And also, I, we also are accountable to how we spend the money. You'll see, if you go to www.sharingfoundation.org, you'll see a lot of documentation about how the money has been spent. Uh, the programs, who's on the board, what the operating budget is, um, you know, quarterly updates, because we have somebody over in Cambodia. Dr. Henry, uh, who's almost 80-something, uh, goes over for a month four times a year to personally oversee the programs. And she, because uh, we have employed 50 Cambodian people in our operation. We have the orphanage, we have a vocational training program, we teach over 1,500 kids English lessons, we're sending 70 kids for high school and another 40 or 50 for college. We have a, um, a house for uh, mothers with AIDS, um, so they get the medication so they won't transport it to the infants. And so that, you know, so there's a lot of oversight. We have mentored and built capacity in country of, of Cambodians stewarding these programs. Okay, questions? Uh, first of all, that we are up to almost 1,000 people now watching the live stream, so. Um, Mary M. Scoble, before I ask the question to Beth, your husband made me promise that I would tell you that he misses you, and he'll see you tonight. Aww. So wave at him, he's watching. <laughs> he's in the chat room with everybody having a great time. Um, Beth, we have a very large, younger teenage audience in Chris's chat room. Um, they are concerned, of course, they don't have PayPal. They can't do the things that you're doing. So they're wondering, you know, how can they get involved? How can they do something like this without just running to their parents and saying, Mommy, will you give me money for this? Or <laughs> Dad, will you sign up for PayPal? And of course, also the biggest one is, what do you see as a way that it can, we can make us as a whole, can make social networking sites safer for kids of that age to do things like this on? Okay, I'm gonna take the first one. Um, uh, the, I had actually some college students who uh, found out about, um, there was one Cambodian American who found out about the campaign and he was on Facebook and he actually set up a whole other group. He canvassed his campus for donations and, and he spread the word to all his friends. He was one of those really highly connected um, Facebook generation, Gen Ys. Um, I think um, if you read 
Vicki Davis, Cool Cat Teacher's blog, that she, that's what she writes about, um, how um, social networks can be used in education in a safe and an instructional way. And I think you should actually, I'll be glad to introduce you to Vicki, because she has more deep subject expertise in that. So if you Twitter me, I will make a connection. admire your passion and, and your love for your cause. I think that's absolutely amazing. And I think all of us here can pull, you know, some little tidbit from, from your presentation. But I, I myself have given, I just noticed before uh, your, your reach out to the audience, we were at $254 and I just refreshed and we're at 1447. So I think that says a lot to, whoa, to everyone whoa. that's here. So, and, and, and I just, he just told me it's still going on through on his side. So it's, it's, it's going up by the minute. So thank you everyone that's thank you. Thank contributing. You. This is really awesome. I'm going. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, thanks again. Every time I see you speak, it's so moving. Um, you were successful because you already had an existing network. Um, and a lot of social, um, sorry, nonprofits don't have any clue as you're beginning to say this. How can they activate people like you? Have you seen some nonprofits actually doing a good job of going out and activating their loyal base? Um, yes, actually the Humane Society. Uh, they have um, actually now a full person dedicated to social networking and has identified all the animal lovers on Facebook and hi High Five. But when I got started, I didn't, I just, when I started two years ago and I raised the $800, I didn't have a huge network. So I started with a really small um, project um, and I only asked people that I ac had met face to face or people that I knew through my blog. So I started with, I, so my advice to nonprofits is they need to not, not start with the big thing, like this is the, the college graduate course, and they need to start at preschool. You know, and the first step of course, as you well know, is the listening and connecting into the conversations and building the relationships and then launching a small pilot to raise a small amount of money. The ones that have not been successful are those that try the big broadcast campaign and it doesn't lead to anything. Beth, two questions. Um, one, you talked about you attempted different things on YouTube, and you said this one worked better, so I was curious as to what exactly you did to test to figure out that was the right thing. And then the second is more, you seem to be successful because what you're doing was so unique and so out there, and I wonder if you worry, if everybody starts doing that, then does it just become the same old thing and then nobody notices it anymore? Okay, so the first question was how did I test it on YouTube? Okay, I, um, I posted the videos and I didn't blog them and I just looked to see where there was more comments and, more, and then more views and, um, and actually one of the other comments that was up there was from someone who first turned me down because she doesn't like to use credit cards online, she wanted to use PayPal and when she saw that video she left a comment saying, okay, I'll, use, I'll pull out my credit card. So I thought, that, so I, it was not scientific. So it was just more, okay, this one got more comments and it actually motivated one or two people to um, donate. So I'm gonna go with this one. Um, your second question was, um, can you repeat it? <laughs> oh, oh, I know, I got it. If, if everyone starts doing what I'm doing, well, you know, we'll become this, you know, it, thing, it, stuff changes. And so I, for me, I'm always experimenting with new things and, and new ideas. Um, so when more people start doing the stuff I was doing two years ago, I'm off trying something new. Um, I do worry about, you know, donor fatigue in a big way. Will people shut off? You know, and I think that's, that could potentially happen if people aren't using the social media tools in a social media way. That they're using them like PBS pledge drives. You know. Okay, okay we're done? Bring me up. Great. Yep. Yes, thank you. thank you, Beth. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. <laughs> oh, oh, wait, I can't leave the money. It's okay. <laughs>